Welcome all again to our Birds of Newfoundland webinar series. Um, tonight we'll be talking about warblers, which is really exciting because they are just the cutest little things. Um, so we're going to have lots of pretty pictures to look at tonight for sure. Um, typically, Catherine does this webinar, so I apologize if it's a little less uh, smooth than usual <laughs> because I hopefully will do it justice tonight. Um, Oh, I guess I should introduce myself. Um, for anyone who is new tonight, uh, my name is Jenna McDermott and I am the assistant coordinator for the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, um, which is a program of Birds Canada in Newfoundland. And <clears throat> um, Birds Canada is a nonprofit organization that runs all across Canada. Um, and our mission is to drive action to increase the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of wild birds in our country. So to do that, we run a variety of different citizen science programs. Um, and citizen science is essentially um, the opportunity for regular people, members of the public, to join in collecting data um, about information that they're passionate about. So in our case, we're usually studying birds. Um, and so citizen science prog uh, programs are programs where uh, the, the general public can become involved in collecting that data that we can then put towards conserving these um, species for the years to come. So each year in Canada, over 74,000 volunteers share their energy and time and love of birds uh, with us at Birds Canada to help us accomplish our, our goals in these programs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so as I mentioned, I work for the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, and that is our main program right now that we're running in Newfoundland. Um, it's only in the island of Newfoundland. And the intention of the atlas is to sort of create a baseline data set of what birds, um, all of the bird species that breed on the island of Newfoundland, sort of where they are and how many there are. So you can see, for example, we have a yellow warbler here in the middle, and we'll look at them later, of course. Um, and the map on the right hand side is all of the data that's come into the breeding bird atlas so far um, in the last four years that uh, are where they're found on the island of Newfoundland. So the different color squares indicate how sure we are that they're breeding in a certain area. And um, this is all data that's come in from members of the public uh, who are registered as volunteers as well as um, some of our own Atlas staff, of course. Um, and the Atlas is a project that anybody can become involved in. Um, and uh, anyone on the call can feel free to register as a volunteer and you can submit your data to our Atlas database and have it also show up on the map like this. Um, and it's sort of available for people of any level of ability. Um, because even if you only know one species, that's still really important information uh, because each species gets a map like this um, and your data will definitely go into it. So um, think about uh, joining the Atlas and um, feel free to reach out if you have more specific questions. We also have another webinar in this series about the Atlas specifically um, that's nearer to the end and I always forget the date of it, um, but you can find it on our schedule online. Um, the second program that we run in Newfoundland actually encompasses Newfoundland and Labrador, and that's the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. Um, this is a program that runs in the early spring each year. So it's only once per year from the 1st of April until the 15th of May. So it's coming up uh, soon. And we have a series of different roadside routes in Newfoundland and Labrador where essentially you can sign up to um, run the route, you drive this um, series of 10 stops and listen to what owls you hear along the way. And so it's a really cool opportunity to get out in the evening, um, listening for owls. And it's something again that anybody is welcome to um, participate in. And there's not too many species of owls to learn. <clears throat> and we will have a, a webinar on the owls of Newfoundland on April 8th. Um, so come to that one if you'd like to learn more about owls or the owl survey. Um, and there is always the opportunity to bring out a handheld recorder if you're not quite sure of your own identification skills for that, but still want to be involved. Um, so feel free to reach out about joining the owl survey as well if you're interested. 
Um, before we go farther on, I just want to thank all of our partners and funders. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to put on um, webinars like this uh, for free. And so thanks to all these folks. And I would also like to acknowledge that the lands where we are conducting our work and living as well um, are the ancestral and current homelands of the uh, Beothic and the Mi'kmaq people. And these people have been protecting and stewarding the lands um, since time immemorial. And through our work in Newfoundland and Labrador, we hope to contribute to that stewardship to be able to protect the species that we share that land with. Um, Birds Canada understands that Indigenous voices, knowledge, and ongoing work on the land are critical for wild birds to thrive in sustainable ecosystems, and we support the needs, aspirations, and rights of Indigenous peoples to care for the land. So this evening, of course, we are talking about warblers. Um, sometimes they can be called jewels of the forest because they're very bright and colorful. Um, sparkling out amongst the leaves. <laughs> uh, the family is called Parulidae. So if you're looking in your uh, field guide, you'll see them named under Parulidae. And warblers are typically quite small, sort of almost chickadee size, very active birds. Um, they're always flitting around amongst the leaves. They're very tiny, as I said, so they are very uh, good at hiding even behind one leaf. Um, and they're also tricky to get a picture of or a good look at sometimes um, since they're always always going out catching insects. Um, they are shaped like this silhouette you can see on the right here with a very thin short pointed bill and that's sort of what they use kind of like tweezers uh, to collect insects uh, from the branches and behind leaves. And often they are very colorful which is why they um, could be called the jewels of the forest. Most of the species only eat insects, so they're not typically eating fruits or berries or seeds or anything like that. Um, and that's why most of these species are migratory. Um, so they're neotropical migrants, which means that they migrate um, down south for the winter. And um, because they wouldn't be able to sustain themselves, of course, in Newfoundland when it's winter and there's not very many insects around. Um, and so they go down to the tropics where they can eat insects for the rest of the year. Um, Catherine is actually down in the tropics right now looking at the warblers so we can all be jealous of her soaking up the, <laughs> the nice winter warblers and the heat. Um, one last thing about warblers is that most of the species are arboreal. So that means that they are up in the trees or um, among the branches with a couple of exceptions that I will mention tonight. Um, as we go along. Some things to look at when we are identifying warblers um, are things that we look at for all birds, of course, as we mentioned in the very first session, but these are things like size. Um, it's a bit difficult with warblers to tell size apart uh, from one species to another, other than a couple of exceptions, again, um, because they are, they are all quite small but there is a little bit of variation. Um, again, very slight variation, but some sometimes the, the shape and the size of the bill can be different. Um, it can be larger, a little bit larger, a little bit smaller, or have a different shape. Um, it's important to look at the length of the wings and the tail. Again, this is probably something that would take a little bit more practice um, because you sort of comparing the length of the wing to the tail. We're noticing that a certain species has a shorter tail than other species or a longer tail, uh, but that can be an important clue, um, especially once you're more familiar. Um, one of the major things we look at with warblers is the color, of course. Um, and so we're looking at things like markings on the face. We're looking at markings on the wings, like wing bars that you could see on this bay-rested warbler here, or patches of color on the wing, that sort of thing. And we're also looking um, specifically at the undertail coverts, which is um, that patch of white that's under the tail feathers here on this bay-breasted warbler. Um, you can see they're white on it. The undertail coverts can be different colors, and it's really important to look at them because often all you're seeing of a warbler is the underside of it. You're not necessarily going to see the side or the top um, because they're up high in the trees. Um, you're only seeing their underside. So taking a look at 
The color under the tail can be an important clue between different species that are quite similar. Um, of course, we want to pay attention to what habitat they're found in, and some of them have very specific behaviors that can um, lead you to a species as well. So we'll talk about all of that as we go along tonight. Um, and then one more sort of side note, I guess, but a very important note um, before we get into our species is that, uh, of course, we're focusing on birds that breed at least occasionally in Newfoundland again um, tonight. And so in cases where males and females look different, which is often the case with warblers, we'll have a picture of both the male and the female. And um, we'll be focusing on breeding plumage again. So that's their summertime plumage in Newfoundland. And this is particularly important for warblers because most of them look actually totally different in the summer compared to the rest of the year. Um, so we'll just take a second to talk about molt. So that's when uh, birds bring in their new feathers or drop their old feathers and bring in new feathers um, once or twice a year. So for most small birds um, undergo one molt per year. So that's in the fall. It's called the pre-basic molt. And so they are sort of shedding their fancy plumage, their fancy feathers of the, of the breeding season. And they're putting on a sort of drabber version of things for the winter. Um, so they molt into what is called their basic plumage for the winter. So they're looking dull and drab for the winter. And then uh, warblers, among some other species, but warblers, since we're talking about them tonight, go through another molt in the spring called the pre-alternate molt. And that typically happens um, on their winter grounds before they migrate. So they migrate up already wearing their breeding plumage, uh, which is called alternate plumage. Um, and so that's why um, during the winter and the breeding season, um, you can have the same species looking totally different. So it's definitely easiest to identify them in the summer when they have on their breeding plumage. Um, and once the fall happens and they're still in Newfoundland, they can actually look totally different and be incredibly confusing. Um, so if you are looking at things in late August or early September, and you have no idea what a warbler is anymore, that's why that's happening. <laughs> and they're difficult even for experts. Um, okay. Oh, there's one more little side note. Um, we've included a little bit of bird song this evening. Um, one, because they really sound nice. <laughs> so it's nice to listen to them, especially in the winter. Um, and of course, it's important to remember that it's, you know, we're not going to learn all of our bird songs in one hour tonight. So, you know, we don't expect you and you shouldn't expect yourself to be able to remember um, all of the ones that we show you this evening. But just as a note that um, bird song has two main purposes, typically um, to attract mates and to defend territories. And so warblers often have two, dis two distinct song, song types, one for each of those purposes. Um, and so if you're listening to a library of songs for a specific species, you might notice that they have more than one different sounding recording. And that's, that's why, because they have um, two different song types. Um, or sometimes more as well. And individuals also can vary quite a lot um, in how they sound as well. We will be having um, our last webinar of this session, um, sorry, of this series will be um, on bird ID by sound alone. Um, so if you're interested in bird song, we'll get more into detail of it on our last session. Okay, here's our first species of the night. This is the oven bird. Um, the oven bird is a little bit of a weird looking bird for a warbler. It's um, it's quite a big, chunky warbler. It's quite a bit larger than most of the other species we're going to see tonight. And it's also less arboreal than many of them. So it's not spending as much time foraging in the branches uh, and up higher in the trees. It's typically foraging on the ground, um, kicking around the leaf litter and looking for insects down on the ground. It also is a ground nester. And so, its name actually refers to the distinctive shape of the nest that it builds, which is a domed nest, a covered nest um, on the forest floor, which resembles what people say a Dutch oven with a side door. Um, and so that's why it's called an oven bird because it makes a nest that looks like a Dutch oven. <laughs> um, oven birds are found in undisturbed mature forest. Um, 
And often it's sort of a mixed forest as well with some deciduous trees. So when we're looking at identifying features for an oven bird, um, apart from its long legs and sort of chunkier body, the colors that it has are olive brown on the back and it has uh, a brilliant white um, undersides other than having these bold black chest spots that go um, quite far down on the body, especially on the sides. If you look to their face, they have a really white eye ring that goes all the way around. Um, it's quite brilliant as well. And then on top of their head, they have orange and black stripes uh, with that middle orange line uh, along the crown. Um, they look quite distinct when it's standing here out on the log, but they're actually quite difficult to see when they're mixed up in the leaf litter uh, because of that striping on their head. So um, this is the first, first song we're gonna play tonight for you. And uh, people say that oven birds say their song as teacher, teacher, teacher. So I'll let you listen to that. Um, maybe you hear that, maybe you don't. The interesting thing about bird song is that uh, people put little mnemonics to them. Um, and sometimes they sound right to your ear and sometimes you can't hear the, the, that word at all. So, <laughs> um, but anyway, their, their song is quite loud and insistent. So it travels pretty far in the forest and it gets louder as it goes along. Um, and though they spend most of their time on the ground and nest on the ground, they will sing from quite high up in the canopy. Um, so if you hear them singing, you probably need to look up to find them. And an interesting note about that song is that even though our ears, our human ears, can't really distinguish the different notes um, other than the teacher section, each of those teacher sections is actually made up of three to five different notes. And the number of notes um, and how they're sung is highly variable among individuals of, or, of the oven bird. And so we as humans can't tell the difference or at least I can't, um, but oven birds can actually recognize each other uh, to the individual by their song. Okay. Um, our next species of the night is the northern water thrush. And this is um, another relatively large warbler. So we're still talking a small bird, um, but relatively large compared to the rest that we're going to see tonight. It has pretty long legs and a long body, um, and it almost has a thrush-like appearance. And so we haven't covered thrushes yet, but think of an American robin, which is a, a typical thrush. And um, they have these long legs, they're good at hopping on the ground and this sort of bulky body and upright posture. And so that's what the Northern water thrush has as well. It's quite a common breeder across Newfoundland. They're usually found in the forest understory near either slow moving water or standing water. Um, and they're, uh, you know, their name is water thrush. <laughs> um, and so they are quite associated with water generally. Um, so they're foraging for insects on the ground as well, just like the oven bird was. And they actually will bob their tail or um, teeter along sort of like um, the spotted sandpiper if you were at the um, shorebirds talk the other night. Um, that also bobbed its tail as it moves along. The northern water thrush also nests on the ground as well. And you can see how well it would um, it would blend in with the with the leaf litter and the ground. So when we look at identifying characteristics for them, we see that um, they're pretty much brown on the back and the wings. There's no markings on the wings, no bars or color, um, extra color. Their breast is um, a pale color with maybe a yellowish wash. The amount of yellow can vary um, between individuals, but it also has um, heavy streaks all the way down the breast and belly. And then if you look to the face, you'll see that they have a brown head as well, but they have a strong buffy eyebrow. Um, so that stripe of pale that goes from the, um, goes from the beak all the way down uh, to the back of the neck. Um, we have the song for the water thrush here as well, too. Um, it sings a loud, emphatic song um, with notes that fall in pitch and also get faster. 
Um, Catherine says that it reminds her of a ball bouncing downstairs. I think it sounds like it's yelling at us. <laughs> um, so I'll let you listen to it and you can see what you think. So that's the northern water thrush. You may have heard it before um, and not known what it was. Okay. Okay. So we'll just take a second before we move on to our next species to compare the oven bird and northern water thrush um, because they are the two that you're most likely to find hopping on the ground and they um, have some similarities, of course. So we have the oven bird on the left and the water thrush on the right. The northern water thrush are overall darker and they are darker brown above, um, whereas the oven bird is sort of a more light greenish gray brown. <laughs> um, note that the oven bird has a, a big white eye ring all the way around the eye, and the northern water thrush does not have any eye ring. Um, they both have this streaking on the breast, but oven bird is pale white underneath, and the water thrush is pale, but it can have sort of a yellowish or um, beigeish wash to it. And then also the northern water, water thrush has that big eyebrow, um, that big pale eyebrow, and no orange crown. They also do live in different habitats. So the oven bird likes mature forests, and the water thrush is almost always found near some sort of water. Okay, let's move on to uh, this cutie, the black and white warbler. Um, the black and white warbler is one of the first warblers to arrive in Newfoundland in the spring, and it also nests on the ground, but it is mostly found up in the trees. Um, so um, black and white warblers can be found in remote areas of Newfoundland, as well as within towns and cities um, in parks, uh, as long as there's trees nearby, you could have a black and white warbler. So this is a species that you might find um, even if you live in St. John's. Um, and, uh, I love watching black and white warblers when they're feeding because their behavior is really, uh, very interesting. They almost move, um, like a nuthatch, which is maybe not helpful because we haven't covered them yet either, but, uh, they'll actually go, I sit down under branches and they're always peeking underneath looking for insects. Um, and it's really cute because rather than, um, just walking along and looking up, they're always also looking underneath. Um, so we have, of course, here the male and the female now, male on the left and female on the right. So far, the other two, the male and the female, looked the same for the oven bird and northern water thrush. But from here on, mostly uh, the males and females look different. So that means they're sexually dimorphic. Um, and typically, like most um, species of birds, the female is generally a duller, um, less colorful version of the male. Um, and so sometimes it's harder to find good pictures of them too, but we have pictures of all of them, I think. <laughs> so, uh, here we have, um, the male black and white warbler on the left and the female on the right. It's aptly named, which is really nice. Uh, it's fully black and white in both the male and the female. So as you can see, um, on the male, we have a big black cheek patch. Um, we have a black and white striped body all over with a dark throat. Um, and the tail is dark with white spots on the outer tail feathers that you can't see on the male so much, but you can see on the female a little bit. If you look at the bill um, closely, you'll see that it's slightly curved downward. Um, it's really a uh, very small curve, but <clears throat> you can see that um, out in the real world as well. <laughs> um, if you look at the female here on the right, You'll see she looks almost the same as the male, except for instead of having a black cheek patch, she doesn't really have a cheek patch or it's almost a little bit gray instead. And then she has a white throat instead of having dark on the throat. But otherwise, they look uh, quite similar to each other. Um, so I mentioned that they often will like peek underneath of branches to find insects under there. And that's actually because they have an extra long hind claw um, and also heavier legs than other warblers, which helps them hold on and move around on the bark easier uh, than some of the other warblers that don't do that. So here we have a song again for this one. Um, it's a nice sort of easily recognizable one once you tune into it. 
Um, and it sounds like a squeaky wheel, people say. So this is what it sounds like. So it sounds like a, a wheel is squeaking on by. That's the black and white warbler. Oh, we're listening again. Okay, <laughs> moving on to the Tennessee warbler. Um, the Tennessee warbler is not really super colorful or distinctive, but its lack of markings is also um, a good a good thing to note. Um, we'll go into its its marks, of course, on the next slide. Um, this is a relatively common breeding warbler in Newfoundland. Um, mostly on the west coast of Newfoundland. And it eats mostly caterpillars during the breeding season. During the winter, it also eats nectar. Um, it's not in Newfoundland during the winter, it's down south. Um, but it's also known as a nectar thief sometimes. And that's because most species that eat nectar, um, think of like a hummingbird, have to go inside the flower to get the nectar out from the base of the flower. Um, so they collect pollen on their face or their body as they go in, and then they spread it to the other flowers nearby where they're also collecting nectar. The Tennessee warbler, on the other hand, sort of bypasses that whole thing, and it just uses its really sharp, pointy bill and pierces the base of the flower and laps up the nectar from there without ever having to get any pollen on itself. So it's really um, kind of sneaky, <laughs> kind of sneaky like that, and is really stealing, stealing this nectar from the flowers. <clears throat> Um, when we look at um, the colors in a Tennessee warbler, you can see a male here on the top. Um, so they're sort of yellow green above with a gray head. Um, they're generally pale all over. They have whitish undersides and they have a bit of a pale eyebrow. Um, it's not very distinct. Um, they have a shorter sort of tail, which you can see a little bit on the picture at the bottom here, the wing extends pretty far along the tail. They don't have any marks on the wings or really a lot of um, bold markings on them at all. Females are basically the same as male look only as males, only a little bit duller. And um, I have this other picture here on the bottom, which might be a female, but we're not really sure <laughs> because they're actually really hard to tell apart. Um, and so females are supposed to have less color contrast between the head and the back, um, but there's quite a lot of contrast in this one on the bottom here. And they're also supposed to have a less defined eyebrow, which this one on the bottom does have a less defined eyebrow, um, but but who knows really actually. Um, we asked a few people about this picture and we couldn't come to a consensus <laughs> on whether it was a male or a female, but we know it's a Tennessee warbler. Um, and I mentioned this super sharp bill, uh, but but it is especially um, stabby looking compared to a lot of the other warbler bills. So just uh, take a look at that as we go along. Okay, our next species here is the Nashville warbler. <clears throat> so the Nashville warbler is actually very uncommon in Newfoundland. Um, it is found in regrowing deciduous or mixed forest that has shrubby undergrowth. Um, so of course in Newfoundland, coniferous forest is typically much more common, which is why maybe we don't have a lot of Nashville warblers. And <clears throat> just an interesting note, because the name is Nashville and we just looked at the Tennessee warbler, is that neither of these species actually breed in Nashville or in Tennessee. But this is just the area where they were first collected um, or where someone um, first named the species um, while they were on migration. So they don't actually breed in Nashville or in Tennessee. They breed up in the boreal forest. Okay, so let's go on to take a look at the male versus female here. And so the males on the left again, um, we have here a small warbler uh, with a round head. It doesn't really look like it has much of a neck, it's sort of like a big puffball. Um, again, we have a relatively plain plumage. The male is olive green on the back, um, yellow under underneath the bottom. Um, he has a gray head, a bold white eye ring, which is a really nice mark for the Nashville warbler. And again, we have a pretty short tail on this bird. 
If you look carefully at the head of the male here on the left, <clears throat> you'll see that there's a little bit of um, chestnut spattered in with the with the gray on the head. Um, and so Nashville warblers do have a chestnut crown on the males, um, but sometimes it can be difficult to see. The females on the right here, um, the females and immatures look similar to each other and they're generally just paler than the males. So again, we have sort of a grayish, uh, a gray head, um, sort of olive green back with some gray mixed in, yellow underneath, but we do still have that really bold white eye ring. Okay. Our next species is the morning warbler. Um, you might think it looks similar to the Nashville warbler, um, but we'll see that it doesn't have any eye ring at all. Um, and it's got a little bit more dark colors on it. Um, so the morning warbler is a common breeder in Newfoundland, but you often don't get a really good chance to see it because they're incredibly sneaky. Um, and they really like to hang out in dense uh, thickets of brush um, and in the undergrowth and they skulk around. And so you can hear one forever and never be able to find it. I have looked for morning warblers sometimes for like tens of minutes and never found them um, because they're so sneaky. They really like early successional habitats. That, so that's areas where the plants are just starting to grow back um, from habitat that was recently disturbed by fires or storms or logging activities, that sort of thing. And because of that, they're sometimes called a fugitive species because they have to actually find new breeding habitat as their old habitat matures. Um, so they're constantly having to find new areas where they can breed. Um, you might also remember from the shorebirds week, if you were here, that some of those shorebirds do a uh, broken wing display. So they'll try and lure predators away from the nest by pretending they have a broken wing that they're injured. Morning warblers will also do that, uh, which is really, uh, really cool for such a small little bird to, <laughs> to try and put itself out in the open like that to get eaten instead of its babies. Um, we again have the male on the left and the female on the right here. <clears throat> the morning warbler is a bit of a chunkier species. It's not quite as slender as some of the others that we're, that we are looking at tonight. <clears throat> again, you'll note it doesn't have any markings on the wing. Um, there's no bars or color. Um, the male on the left here is yellow underneath, um, sort of olive green on the back again, yellowish. He has a very distinct gray hood on and a black chest. <clears throat> no markings around the eyes. The female is, uh, females and matures look similar to each other. And they're, again, sort of a paler, less colorful version of the male. So they, again, have no markings on the wing. They're yellowish underneath. They have gray on the head and um, a grayish green back. Um, but sometimes they show a little bit of a ring around the eye. Um, that's not, it's not a complete ring, but they can have little arcs above and below the eye. Um, but you'll note that the females in mature don't have that black chest um, or any black underneath of the chin. Um, I'll show you the song of the morning warbler. It is quite distinct once you've learned it, but um, sometimes it can be hard to pick up, I feel like. Um, it's sort of a gravelly, rougher kind of sound, and some people describe it as churry, churry, churry. Uh, so you can hear it now. Play it again. And that can be totally maddening because you can hear that so close by sometimes that you can just never find the morning warbler. <laughs> okay. Our next species is the common yellowthroat. The common yellowthroat, much like its name says, is a common breeder in Newfoundland. Um, it's mainly found in very wet areas, marshy habitats. It likes low, uh, dense vegetation. And again, it can be very difficult to find, especially the females. The males luckily will come up to the tops of open branches and sing. So you can typically get a better look at them, but the females can be incredibly, incredibly difficult to find. Um, we have again, the male on the left is pretty distinctive. Um, I don't think we can really mix them up with much else in Newfoundland um, because of that really bold patterning on the face. So we have a bright yellow throat. We have a very uh, distinct black mask. 
um, a strong black mask with a white border along the top. The rest of the body is sort of this um, olive green color and uh, yellow along, along the belly. Um, and you can't really see it in this picture here, but the undertail coverts, that section under the tail is also yellow. The female on the right um, is a really indistinct kind of bird. Um, she doesn't have any of the markings on the face that the male has. She's sort of brownish above and yellowish underneath. Um, and she can have a varying amount of yellow in the, th in the throat. Um, sometimes it's quite yellow and sometimes it's very dull. Um, I have the song of the common yellow throat here as well. And people like to say that it says witchity, witchity, witchity. I don't think that it sounds like that in Newfoundland um, because birds can have geographical dis uh, differences between their songs as well. I think it, that's not a good mnemonic for them in Newfoundland, but maybe you hear it, maybe you think of something else, um, but I'll let you listen to that now. Maybe sounds similar, but has an extra syllable. That is the common yellow throat. Okay, here we have uh, a wonderfully distinct bird, the American red start. Um, we like to call it a Halloween bird. I don't know if anyone else calls it that other than myself and Catherine, but uh, just the colors of that male here on the left uh, really look like Halloween. Um, it's very recognizable because of that, those distinct colors, but also the shape of the body is, is quite different from a lot of the other warblers. The tail is quite long in comparison um, and they often flick the tail or flick the wings um, where they're flashing the bright colors that are uh, on, their, on their body. And that's used to flush the insects out of the foliage so that they can go and catch them. Um, but it can also mean that, you know, as a human looking at them, you get a really uh, distinct behavior and you get to see those colors on the, on the body as well to, to help identifying them. Um, American red starts are also a common breeder in Newfoundland, especially in deciduous forests that have an understory of small trees. So again, we have the male here on the left who is really very distinct, um, unmistakable. There's nothing else that looks like it in Newfoundland. Um, so he's black sort of all over except for on the belly um, with these bright, brilliant orange patches on the sides on the wings and also on the side of the tail, if you look carefully in the picture there. Um, we have a female on the right here and uh, she's sort of colored in the same patterning as the male, but the colors are different. So instead of being black, uh, she's um, a grayer or sort of olive colored on the back um, and pale underneath the whole body uh, with no, no darkness in the, in the neck or chest. And instead of having bright orange, she has yellow, um, a bright yellow in the under, under the wings on the sides of the tail and also um, on, the, on the wing as well. But uh, this individual doesn't really have a lot of color on the wing. Um, males that are less than, um, males that are in their first season of breeding will also look a lot like the female. So they have what's called delayed plumage maturation. Um, and that means that males don't actually develop this brilliant uh, black and orange color until their second year of breeding. Um, so in their first year of breeding, they'll still uh, attempt to have territories and attract females, and they can also um, successfully breed and raise young, uh, but sometimes they're less successful than once they have gotten their really fancy plumage in the next year. Um, we don't have the song of the American Red Star here because it is notoriously difficult and they are incredibly good at uh, singing other species songs or what we think sounds like other species songs. Um, so we're not gonna, we're not gonna get into the Red Star song today. <laughs> um, and before we go on to our next species, we'll just take a, a little sidebar here to talk about um, an ecological effect called carryover effects, um, which is really cool, um, a really cool thing that was first studied in the birding world 
through American Red Starts. Um, so for most of the migratory birds in Newfoundland or in North America, we know a lot about what happens to them on the breeding grounds if we know much about them at all, but we know very little about what happens to them during the rest of the year. So it's obviously not realistic though to think that um, the breeding season occurs as a totally separate entity from the rest of the year because it's the same bird, of course, the same individual um, migrating, going into its wintering grounds um, and living that whole life, of course. So clearly events that happen during the other parts of the annual cycle will affect the breeding season. And so that is what we define as a carryover effect when events in one season affect the outcome of a subsequent season. So in Red Starts, there was actually a number of studies in the early 2000s that showed that males who spent the winter in a low quality dry habitat um, in the Caribbean did much more poorly during the breeding season than males that overwintered in a high quality um, habitat like a mangrove swamp. Um, and so that was started uh, in the birding world, a whole new field of research on carryover effects. And that all started from the American Red Start. Okay, here's our next species, the Cape May Warbler. <clears throat> um, the Cape May Warbler is generally uncommon in Newfoundland, um, <clears throat> but it can be um, sometimes more, more common of a breeder. <laughs> um, it's not found in a lot of the range maps in Newfoundland, um, as far as I know. The Cape May Warbler nests in spruce and fir forests that are, um, and they're most numerous where there's a lot of spruce budworm. So in Newfoundland in the past few years, there has been um, a spruce, uh, sort of an uprising in spruce budworm. And I'll show you a picture of them a little bit later. Um, and it's a, it's a caterpillar. And so Cape May warblers actually have a larger clutch size, which is the number of eggs that they have in, uh, in their nest than other birds. So they have six eggs in their clutch instead of um, typically less than that. And so that might allow their population to actually expand rapidly when there's a spruce budworm outbreak um, because they have so much more potential um, offspring with each nesting season. Um, the Cape May warbler also will feed on nectar in the summer, or sorry, in the winter. And they actually have a specially shaped tongue, which is curled and semi-tubular that allows them to sip nectar from flowers. <clears throat> so when we look at their colors here or their identifying characteristics, you can see that they have a really short, um, sorry, a really thin bill. Again, it's very, very pointed. Um, they have white undertail coverts. So you can see on the male here, uh, the male on the left, again, is much more brightly colored than the female on the right. Um, he has a chestnut cheek patch, uh, which is encased in sort of a yellow collar and a yellow eyebrow. Um, and then he also has black streaks along the chest and the flanks and um, is sort of this greenish yellow color on the back as well. That we see in a lot of the different warblers. And then he's black on the top of the head. The female on the right here um, is again, more dull version, um, generally uh, olive gray or more brownish colored than the male. Um, she doesn't really have that extended chestnut cheek patch. She can have a bit of color there, but not that brilliant hue in comparison to the bright yellow color. Um, and so she only has pale yellow along the breast um, and sort of paler yellow in the face as well. Um, you also see that the Cape May Warbler has uh, this one wing bar um, on the wing rather than having a uh, completely unmarked wing. Okay, so I said I would show you a picture of a spruce budworm. So this here is a spruce budworm, this caterpillar. Um, it grows into a moth and it's native in North America and in Newfoundland. Um, they go through natural cycles in the boreal forest. Uh, where you'll have years, um, 30 to 40 years of low numbers of them. And then it will come into a outbreak where they will, their numbers will just increase exponentially. Um, and then you'll just find like trees dripping with spruce budworm, basically. Um, they feed on balsam fir and spruce. 
And so they'll eat all the new growth. And then once the new growth is gone, they'll continue eating the needles. Um, and eventually after four or five years of the spruce budworm eating all of the leaves, um, the trees will often die. And so that's also an important part of cycling in the boreal forest, where then you get new growth coming up um, from an area that has been eaten by spruce budworm in an outbreak. Um, so in Newfoundland, we do have an outbreak right now, but it's being controlled um, by the province um, so that all the trees don't get eaten. <laughs> um, if you go to Grossborn National Park, uh, they are not spraying for spruce budworm, so you'll um, see more effects of them there, but also um, you might see more numbers of birds who rely on them. So um, there are several species of birds called the budworm, budworm warblers. And these are the Tennessee warbler, the Cape May warbler, the bay-breasted warbler, and the Blackburnian warbler. And they all have uh, populations that cycle along with uh, spruce budworm outbreaks. So we are right now in Newfoundland having more numbers of these certain species um, than we typically do when it's not a spruce budworm year. Okay. Back on to our warblers. <laughs> um, this is the northern perula. So the northern perula is not very common in Newfoundland, but it is common through the other Atlantic provinces and eastern Canada generally. Um, we mostly find them in the Codroy Valley in the southwestern section of the island. They actually build their nests in hanging epiphytes. Uh, so those are air plants. And in Newfoundland, that would be things like um, beard moss or old man's beard, that kind of thing. Um, which is a really cool place to build a nest. Um, we have the male on the left and the female on the right again. Um, you can see one of the, the um, boldest cues, I guess, to look for on the male is this bright yellow throat and breast uh, with that dark band along the middle, um, as well as some chestnut underneath uh, the dark band along the throat. Um, You'll see that he also has white eye crescents. So um, there's a white crescent underneath of the eye there. And you can also see on the male and female that they have white wing bars uh, present on the wing. They are white underneath and have um, a gray back um, with some, a yellow olive or a yellowish olive back patch as well. The female on the right there um, looks very similar to the male but she's uh, a little bit duller again and um, doesn't have that dark sort of necklace uh, across the throat and doesn't have um, as much chestnut on the chest either. Um, you'll also see if you get a really good look at them that they have a yellow lower bill, um, <laughs> which I think would be pretty difficult to see when they're uh, flitting around in the bushes, but it is there. Okay, now we're moving on to a very common warbler in Newfoundland, the magnolia warbler. Um, magnolia warblers are found in coniferous forests and um, using habitat is actually a really important cue for telling apart magnolia warblers and American red starts if you're just hearing them because they can sound very similar. Um, so magnolia warblers are in coniferous forest and they really like forests that has close growing young trees or more mature forests, as long as they have a dense understory. So a lot of trees down in the lower level. Um, the magnolia warbler, you know, as you might expect, in Newfoundland is not found in magnolia trees. Um, this is another species that was named on migration um, where it was uh, collected in a magnolia tree. And so it was named the magnolia warbler. Okay. And um, so this is a pretty striking bird as well. Um, but since we have a lot of warblers that are sort of a combination of yellow and black and white, let's take a closer look at uh, where we have the colors here. So um, one thing you might notice that's very distinct on the male here on the left is this strong black necklace um, with these stripes coming down from it that almost look like big beads like hanging down on a necklace. Um, and that's backed by a brilliant yellow throat and all the way down through the uh, breast and belly. On the back, you'll see that uh, he's mostly sort of a gray or black color. Um, 
and he has a strong black mask with a white eyebrow. And if you look to the wing, you'll see that there's a big white wing panel. Um, so we don't have an unmarked wing here. If we look over to the female on the right, again, we have a sort of duller version of the male. And um, the amount of streaking on the breast can vary quite a lot by individual, um, but we don't have quite the distinct amount of streaking that we have on the male. Um, we have a gray head, we still have that white eyebrow, and we have a white eye ring, but we don't have a black mask on the female. Um, again, we have white wing bars, and we have white undertail coverts on both the male and the female, and actually a really good mark that is not shown well in these pictures here, and one of the best marks is that um, there is a big black band at the bottom of the tail of the Magnolia warbler. Um, none of the other warblers in Newfoundland have a black band at the base of the tail. So if only, if you ever see just the tail of a warbler and it has a black band at the bottom, it's a Magnolia warbler. Um, am I missing anything here? I don't think so. Okay. We'll move on to the bay-breasted warbler then. Um, bay-breasted warblers are relatively uncommon in Newfoundland, but it, this is one of the budworm warblers that I mentioned. And so they have had uh, more numerous populations in the last few years than we typically have. Um, so they can be found a little bit more often. Um, in 2020, they were detected as likely breeding in Barishwa Pond Provincial Park, which is on the West Coast near Stephenville. Um, for the first time in 11 years. Uh, so it's it's really cool to be able to see them right now if you get a chance to get out this summer and find some. Um, um, the bay-breasted warbler is found in a dense coniferous forest that has small openings among it, um, but you won't be finding these in deciduous trees very much. Okay. So let's look at uh, their color here. The male on the left is um, quite boldly marked as, as is the case for a lot of these warblers. So if we look at the face, we'll see that he has a dark face um, across the whole face um, with a sort of chestnut or what they call bay colored throat. And um, that goes down sort of under the wings as well. And you'll see the same color of uh, brown on the top of the head. Um, he also has a pale color at the nape of his neck. And his back is dark and streaked. And he has thick wing bars um, that stand out very well. Um, the female on the right there, again, uh, <laughs> a duller version of the male. So she has still that um, brown color along the, the throat and breast and going down under the wings. Um, that um, The amount of brown there is variable for females. So sometimes they barely show any at all. Um, and sometimes they can be quite uh, heavily marked like this female. And they don't have any black on their face. Um, so they're more generally brown above. <clears throat> um, the bay-breasted warbler is one of the ones that changes like quite quite a lot in the uh, when they uh, molt into their winter plumage. And so on fall migration, they actually end up looking a lot like black pool warblers, which we'll get to later, um, despite looking totally different during the summer. Okay, here is the black Bernian warbler. The black Bernian warbler is gorgeous, as you can see. <laughs> um, no wonder they are called jewels of the forest. Um, they breed in mature evergreen and also mixed forest and they are forest canopy specialists. So they are right up at the tippy top of the trees. They will give you what is called warbler neck, trying to look at them. Um, that's a term that birders use for looking so high up in the trees for warblers all the time that your neck hurts. Um, but they are incredibly beautiful. So if you get a chance to see them, it's definitely worth it. Um, they are not very common in Newfoundland, but again, they can be found in the Southwest coast, typically um, in the Codbury Valley or surrounding areas. Um, and one thing that they do that I've never seen uh, before, but have heard about is that 
um, male black Bernian warblers in the springtime will actually have territorial conflicts and they'll chase each other around um, through the treetops and fly around in huge loops and then plummet down towards the earth um, in a whirling pattern together. And then uh, they'll glide out of that with their tail spread out and slowly flap around in what's called a moth flight. Um, and then once, you know, everyone's settled out who's got their territory where, then they'll stop doing that. And they probably are much more energetic in the rest of their day because they're not doing that crazy flight anymore. But that would be really cool to see. Um, so if we are taking a look at their colors, we'll see that uh, males there on the left have a brilliant flame orange throat and face. Um, so that's quite distinct. Um, he has black markings throughout in sort of a triangle ear patch and also has a black crown. Um, he's otherwise white underneath with a big uh, white wing patch and um, a dark back. The female on the right is again, sort of a duller version. Um, instead of that brilliant flame orange throat, she has uh, a bit of a duller yellow throat with the yellow through the face as well. And instead of that black cheek patch, um, she has um, this sort of gray or brown cheek patch. I, um, you can see though on her, the white wing bars and the black back as well. Okay, we'll move on now to the yellow warbler. The yellow warbler is one of the most common warblers, um, as well as the most one of the most easily visible warblers in Newfoundland. Um, sometimes people say that they saw a canary, and uh, it's probably either a yellow warbler, like you see here, or an American goldfinch, um, because they're both brilliant yellow. And yellow warblers are found in um, thickets along, um, along riverbanks, or in young forests, um, but they're also quite common along roadsides. So where all of those alders have uh, been cut down and are regrowing, um, you can often find yellow warblers sort of filled in those bushes there. Yellow warblers actually have a really wide breeding range in North America. They breed all across, um, all the way to Alaska, but they also breed throughout Mexico and Central America. Um, and so there's a lot of variation uh, between these different populations and how they build their nests um, and how their song sounds and other things like that. Um, but in Newfoundland, we have ones that look just like these guys here. So um, thankfully their name tells us that they're fully yellow. Uh, both the male and the female are fully yellow. And uh, the male on the left there has also these chestnut streaks uh, that go down the breast. And sometimes he doesn't have quite as many as this individual here, but you always see um, some of that chestnut streaking. They don't have any marks on the face and they don't have any marks on the wing. Um, and they're generally just yellow all over. <laughs> um, the female over there on the right looks almost the same as the male, but she doesn't have that chestnut streaking on the breast. Um, but otherwise she looks uh, pretty much just the same. Sometimes the yellow is a little bit more muted. Um, we have a song here again for the yellow warbler. Um, if they're singing this like very typical song that I'm about to play, then they can be easy to identify. Sometimes they sing other versions, uh, but this version people say is sweet, sweet, I'm so sweet. Um, and so you can see if you can hear that. So go sweet, 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 I'm so sweet. And so you can often hear that um, throughout all of these older bushes along, along the edges of old roads. Okay, here we have the black pool warbler. The black pool warbler is um, pretty common in Newfoundland. They like um, often higher elevation areas but they can be found throughout the island. And they are found in uh, balsam fir forests or Tuckamore. Um, and for those who aren't uh, familiar with the term Tuckamore, that just means um, spruce forests or forests that are bent and tangled by winds, um, like uh, by strong winds that are typically on the coast of Newfoundland or in high elevation areas as well. Um, the breeding range for the black hole warbler is the farthest north of all of the warblers. 
And um, so there, it's pretty special to be able to have them in Newfoundland. Um, we have a, it's mostly black and white um, for the meal. Um, they're similar to the black and white warbler, um, but you'll see that the, the top of the head is fully black. So it has a fully black cap without any uh, stripes on it. It has a, a bright white cheek. It's white underneath. And its back is um, sort of streaked uh, with black um, and generally dark gray and black streaked. You also see that it has white wing bars and sometimes has some yellow edging on the wing as well. Um, if you look to the legs of both the male and the female, you'll see that they're bright orange. Um, and that's a diagnostic mark for the black bull warbler. If you get a chance to look at just some legs of a bird and you see that they're orange and it's a warbler, um, then you've got a black bull. We have the female here on the right. Um, she looks quite a bit different from the male because she doesn't really have that black and white plumage. Um, she's more of um, this yellowish uh, kind of <laughs> greeny brown color. It's so hard to describe bird colors. <laughs> um, sort of all over. And um, she just has a little bit of marking on the face with this uh, bit of a dark eye line going through. She does have though those um, those wing bars, those white wing bars, as well as some yellow edging on the wing. <clears throat> and if you saw her whole back, you'd see that it was finely streaked with um, dark streaks along it as well. The Blackpool Warbler um, is has one of the highest frequency songs of all of the warblers. Um, so it's quite distinctive, but it can be very hard to hear. Um, and one of the first songs that you would start um, losing uh, as you age or as you lose your hearing. So um, Catherine likes to call it nature's hearing test and uh, I'll play it for you now. Um, so some folks might not hear it and some folks might hear it, uh, but this is a black pool warbler. So it's a really high tsit tsit tsit. I'll play it once more. Okay. Um, and black hole warblers are, um, well, apart from being a good hearing test, <laughs> are really cool because they have one of the largest or longest migrations. Um, out of all of the warblers. <laughs> so there's some birds in Western North America that actually travel 16,000 kilometers um, from Alaska to Brazil and back again every single year. Um, so you can see their range map here. We have the summer range up here in uh, pink or orange and the winter in, in blue. And um, on this side of the continent, so uh, the ones that are coming from Newfoundland, they actually fly more than 3,000 kilometers straight over the water from the northeastern U.S. Um, all the way to the Caribbean or to South America, which is actually a nonstop journey of roughly three days of flying, which is incredible <laughs> because this little bird only weighs um, less than half an ounce, which is in real terms the weight of one CD or roughly three nickels. And that thing flies for three full days over water, um, which means that they hold the record for the longest overwater journey of any songbird. And it also means that they have to stock up on energy before they leave. So they can actually eat uh, enough to double their body mass um, before they head out on migration um, in the fall, which is what this little guy is probably up to with his mouth full of food. Okay. Onto our next species here, we have the palm warbler. Um, the palm warbler is is common across Newfoundland, um, but sort of in patchy location. So it likes open areas. Uh, so for example, bogs and fens that have a border of spruce trees. So it, it likes to have vegetation among open areas, um, but we've found it a lot along power line cuts in weedy fields uh, where the trees are are still quite shrubby and there's a lot of open area around. 
Um, again, the name is a bit misleading. It's obviously not found breeding in palm trees in Newfoundland. Um, again, this was um, where it was in the winter in the Caribbean, um, where it got its name. So um, again, it's uh, pretty common in Newfoundland and Canada's boreal forest actually is estimated to be home to 98% of all the palm warblers in the summer, which is pretty crazy. Um, and makes Newfoundland a really important place to uh, make sure that we're conserving them. Palm warblers is another species, uh, much like the oven bird and northern water thrush that we saw at the beginning, that is most commonly seen foraging on the ground. And so it will hop around uh, collecting insects and it often wags its tail, um, which can help scare out insects for it to find. Um, so males and females of the palm warbler actually look the same. Uh, so this is just uh, the adult here. We have a sort of fully yellow bird um, with a brown back and has some rusty streaks on the on the sides here and also a bright rusty cap. Um, and that I find is the easiest mark to, to see on the palm warbler is that bright rusty cap with the yellow eyebrow underneath. Um, the palm warbler has a really interesting song. It's not um, as sweet and like, um, and musical as a lot of the warblers that I've showed you already this evening. It sounds almost like an insect sometimes. Um, so I'll let you listen to that and maybe you've heard one before too. So it's a really interesting one. Okay. Um, so we'll move on now to the yellow rumped warbler. The yellow rumped warbler is quite common in Newfoundland. Um, it's also our first warbler that arrives back in the spring. Um, so you'll know spring is coming when the yellow rumped warblers start appearing. And it's affectionately named Butterbutt uh, for obvious reasons that you could see here <laughs> on, the, on the picture on the left there. Um, yellow rumped warblers are very... Uh, versatile at where they're foraging. So they can be um, they can be foraging within the forest. They'll also forage on seaweed at the beach. Um, they'll take insects off the surface of water, like rivers. Um, they'll pick them out of spider webs. So they're um, really quite variable in where they're finding their food. They also are capable of eating berries during the fall and the winter. And that's why um, we can find them so early in the season and sometimes so late in the fall in Newfoundland still. Mm. Okay, so we again have the male on the left here and the female on the right, and they look um, quite different, but uh, both the male and the female have what's in their name, that yellow rump. So um, the male here, you can see it quite well. The female, she has her wings folded over on top of it. Um, so sometimes you can't see that yellow patch, but if they, um, have their wings held in a different way, or if you see them flying, you'll definitely see that yellow rump. Um, they also have yellow underneath of the wing in both the male and the female. Um, it's a bit more muted in the female, of course, but you can see it's quite brilliant in the male. Um, the male is also otherwise uh, gray, black, and white. So he's gray along the back with streaks. He has two white wing bars. He has a white throat and a big black mask with a white eyebrow. Um, the female on the right here is sort of brown, all, brown above, um, paler with yellow wash underneath the, underneath the belly and, um, has some streaking along the sides, but she also has a white throat and both the male and the female, um, you can't see it in the male very well, also have a, a yellow patch on the top of the head. Um, yellow rump warblers have a different subspecies in, subspecies in the east and west of North America. And so the eastern subspecies looks like what we have here. Um, it's called the Myrtle Warbler. And the western subspecies is called the Audubon's Warbler. And it actually, it actually has a yellow throat in the male instead of a white one. But you won't see those in Newfoundland unless one is really lost. <laughs> okay, we also have the Black-Throated Green Warbler in Newfoundland. This is a common warbler as well, but it's found more often in uh, mature forest and mixed woodland. So you're finding it more 
uh, where you also have some uh, deciduous trees sometimes. And it tends to stay up really high in the canopy. Um, so um, you often see just the underside of this bird as well. Um, the black-throated green warbler is dependent on having really large areas of conif coniferous forests. Um, and it can actually become quite vulnerable when the habitat is fragmented into small pieces uh, through either harvesting or insect infestations um, like the spruce budworm. Uh, but they do feed on caterpillars and insects in the summer, so they'd eat a lot of them. And they, of course, pick those off uh, from the trees in this case. We have here on the left the black-throated green male. And um, as per his name, you can see that he has a really distinct black throat. Um, he's called a green warbler. And he does have a bit of a greenish wash on the back, but it, it's pretty dull, uh, not a brilliant green that you might expect. Um, he has a yellow face and a sort of dusky greenish ear patch, but that's uh, a little bit trickier to see um, unless you have a good, good look at him. And you'll see he also has a white belly and white undertail coverts. Um, and he also has white wing bars. The female here on the right doesn't have the black throat. Um, sometimes there can be a little bit of color in there, but uh, typically it's quite pale uh, or white. And she has black streaks through the sides like the male did um, and a yellow face, but she's a, a little bit duller with sort of a duskier color on the on the cheek patch as well as the, the top of the head. Um, the song of the black throated green is quite distinctive. Um, I think it's one of the easiest to remember. Um, you know, that's <laughs> that's my personal that's my personal opinion. So you might not agree. Um, it is end endlessly repeated, um, and since they're often so high up, it's a nice one to learn, um, because then you'll know that the black thirty green is there, even if you can't see it. Um, so I'll let you listen to it. I think it says its name, black, black thirty green, uh, but other people say that it says trees, trees, I love trees. Okay, um, and I think we just have one more species left, um, but just before we go into that one, just another cool note uh, about ecology. So some of you might have noticed that I've talked about um, several different species of warbler in one different kind of habitat, um, sharing all the same habitat. So how can all of these warblers manage to live together and all have enough food in this one uh, similar habitat? Um, and that was a longstanding question in community ecology which is the study of how species interact. Um, and so in the 1950s, there was an ecologist named Robert MacArthur, who was Canadian born. And he tried to answer that question for five different species of warblers that all shame to say, share the same breeding grounds in mature coniferous forest. So he was looking at Cape May, yellow rumped warbler, black threaded green, black Bernian, and bay breasted warblers. And he wanted to know how they could all manage to coexist in the same area um, without outcompeting each other. So what he found was that they don't actually occupy the same exact area. <laughs> so even though we consider them to be in the same habitat, they actually divided themselves among the space, um, among the space in the tree. So for example, um, he found that Cape May warblers spent most of the time at the very tippy top of trees on the outside of the tree. He found Blackburnian warblers occupied the area just below the top also on the outside. Black throated greens occupied um, the same height as the black Bernian, but sort of more in the inside of the tree rather than the outside. Bay breasted warblers were in the middle interior and yellow rumped warblers moved around a lot, but they spent most of their time down near the bottom. And so we can go into a mature forest and expect all these species, um, but they're not actually competing with each other very much. They're actually occupying their own uh, special space of the forest as well. Okay, I think this is our final species for the evening. 
Um, but I might be wrong. <laughs> um, this is the Wilson's warbler. So the Wilson's warbler is also a common breeder in Newfoundland. Um, unlike the black-throated green that we just saw, the Wilson's warbler spends most of their time in the understory, so the lower areas of the forest. Um, they also nest on the ground, and they like wet meadows or um, thickets near streams, especially with willows and alders. And we see them a lot in, in similar areas to yellow warblers in those alder hedges along old roads. Um, okay, so we have the male on the left again, and you can see that uh, both the male and the female are generally yellow all over, uh, but they're darker on the back, sort of with an olive back. And the male has this very distinct black cap, like a little teeny hat sitting on top of his head. Um, the female is uh, yellow as well, um, but she doesn't have that black cap. She has an olive crown instead. Um, so um, she's not quite as distinct as the male, especially when comparing to a yellow warbler. Um, and they also have a quote unquote beady black eye, um, which you can see is like sort of pops right out of the face there. Um, <laughs> and so that might be noticeable uh, when you see them in the field as well. So we'll just compare the female yellow warbler to the Wilson's warbler uh, because they can look quite similar. So we have the yellow warbler here on the left. Um, if you remember, she doesn't have that chestnut streaking on the breast, except for maybe a little bit. And overall, she's all yellow. Um, the female Wilson's warbler is yellow. She's darker on the back. Um, and she has sort of a darker, darker crown, um, which makes it look like she has a distinct yellow eyebrow rather than the Wil uh, yellow warbler, which has a pretty plain yellow face altogether. Okay, that was uh, that was our last species. <laughs> um, and I know we had a lot to go through tonight, um, but we just have a few um, polls at the end here to test your knowledge and see uh, what you can remember from earlier. And again, uh, as usual, it is um, anonymous and just for fun. So uh, this is our first one. I'll see if I can get the poll up and running. Um, let's see here. Okay, I think you should be able to see the options. Okay, I see some answers coming in, so it must be working. So which species do we have here? Close it up in uh, 10 or 15 seconds. So get your answers in just for fun, remember? Nice to see what everyone's thinking. Okay, I'll close that up then and share the answers with you. Okay, so we have most people saying uh, bay-breasted warbler, which is correct. Um, so it has that really distinct uh, chestnut throat that extends down under the wings. So this is a nice, brilliant male with that black face mask. Uh, the American Red Start also has, um, you know, a lot of black with some color, but he doesn't have the color in the throat. And if you remember, he's got that brilliant orange and that dark black, the Halloween bird. Blackpool warblers are fully black and white um, without any other colors. Um, and the Northern Perula has a bright uh, yellow throat and is gray on the back. Um, and also has a, a, a big uh, white eye ring. Okay, so bay breasted warbler. And here's our next species. I'll share the pool. Okay, who is this species?
close this up in 10 seconds. Okay. Okay, so this is what we have uh, for everyone for this species. Seems uh, a little bit more confusing. And we are going back in like an hour ago, I think, to, <laughs> to remember this one. Um, the majority did get it correct with morning warbler. Um, Tennessee warbler uh, is overall quite quite bland. It doesn't have uh, that dark, dark black um, breast patch there. <clears throat> Um, and is gener generally sort of grayer and uh, not nearly as brilliantly yellow. Um, the Nashville warbler also doesn't have that dark chest patch um, and would have a bright white ring around the eye. Um, the Northern Perula um, does have a dark patch on the, on the chest on the male, um, but he would have had a white belly and a yellow orange throat instead of gray. Okay, so this is a morning warbler. And here we have another one. I think I have uh, seven, seven of these, so we're on three. Warblers are really nice that they're so brightly colored, but can get uh, tricky when so many <laughs> are a combination of yellow and black and white. Okay, I'll close this up in a few seconds to so get your answers in if you want to try. Okay. Oh, another one quickly came in. <laughs> okay, I'm going to close it out <laughs> um, and share the results with you. Um, so we have um, a little bit of a split between Northern Water Thrush and Up and Bird here. Um, Magnolia Warbler and Wilson's Warbler are both um, sort of bright, brighter with a lot of yellow on them. Um, so we're going to discount those as options. Um, the Northern Wild Thrush and Ovenbird both have this streaking on the belly. Um, they have this sort of um, long-legged, upright appearance. Um, but this is an Ovenbird, and we know that because it has this bright white eye ring, um, this really clean white color underneath. And you can see a little bit of uh, the streaks on the crown, but it's a little hard to tell. Uh, the Northern Water Thrush, remember, wouldn't have that white eye ring, and it would have a um, pale eyebrow that goes all the way down the back of the neck. Okay. So this is a oven bird. And here's our next species. I'll give you your options here. Got a lot of answers coming in quickly this time. Very nice. I won't leave it open too much longer then. We're already at 85%, <laughs> 87. <laughs> okay, I'll close this in three seconds. Okay, 90% of people answered, that's wonderful. Um, so we only have two answers that people picked, which was black pool and black and white. And that's great because the other two species um, have colors other than black and white on them. So um, the important thing to remember here is that black pool warblers don't have any 
uh, white on the top of the head, they would have just one uh, fully black head on the top. Um, so this is a black and white warbler. And also uh, one other thing is the color of the legs on the black pole warbler would have been um, orange. Very good. So black and white warbler. Okay, this one is um, not the clearest picture, but you don't always get the clearest view of birds in the real world either. So what does everyone think about this one? Close this up in 10 seconds or so. Okay. I will, oh, so many answers just now. Okay, I'm gonna end this and share your results. Um, so we have a bit of a split of answers here, uh, but majority said American Red Start. This is an American Red Start. Um, I was a bit tricky here and showed you a female or uh, immature or um, a younger male. Um, so it doesn't have quite the brilliant um, black and orange that we were talking about uh, with the males. Um, but all of the other species here, we wouldn't have any um, color on the side of the tail, which is maybe a little tricky to see in this picture. Um, the bay-breasted warbler, has sort of that chestnut color along uh, the throat and under the wing rather than yellow. The yellow rumped warbler um, would um, have dark through the chest as well as two white wing bars. And the northern perula would have a bright yellow throat um, rather than having a white throat. Okay, that was a tricky one. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we will have this one and one more. Yes, okay, so this is the second last. What species do we have here? Seems to be a difficult one. Um, I'll leave it open for 10 more seconds or so. Okay, hey, I'm gonna close this up now. Okay. Um, okay, so I was mean again, and I put a female. <laughs> Um, we have a pretty even split between our species here, common yellow throat, magnolia warbler, northern perula, and Nashville warbler. And that's because, you know, a lot of their, their bright yellow, these birds, um, the diagnostic mark here that is the, the tell all is this black band at the bottom of the tail. And that goes with the magnolia warbler. Um, so none of the other species will have that black band at the base of the tail. Um, common yellow throat. Um, would have had a striking black mask on the male. If it was a female, it wouldn't be nearly this bright at all. Um, the northern perula would have a, a bright colored throat, but the, the belly would have been white and um, also wouldn't have any black streaks on the side. And the Nashville warbler, oh, sorry, that was the Nashville warbler. 
I just mixed up two words together. I mashed two words together. <laughs> the Nashville warbler wouldn't have any black streaks on the side, but it does have that big eye ring. Um, so that's pretty confusing. Um, and the northern perula uh, would have a white belly um, and also no, no black streaks. Uh, but this was a tricky one. Keep an eye on that tail for the magnolia warbler. Okay. And then this is our final one. And I know we are running right into our hour and a half. Um, so if you have to head out, uh, feel free to do so. But here is the final quiz. Okay, I'll close this up in uh, just a few seconds, but it looks like most people have already answered, so that's great. Okay, here's your results. Um, we eliminated common yellowcoat and magnolia warbler. That's great. Um, this is a Cape May warbler. Um, as 67% uh, of folks said, so that's wonderful. Um, it has that very distinct sort of chestnut cheek uh, cheek patch, which is um, the Cape May warbler male's calling card. Um, the black Bernian warbler um, would have a black ear patch and would have a really brilliant uh, flame throat, flame orange throat, um, rather than having this uh, sort of browner face. Um, so this is a Cape May warbler here, very nice. Okay. Oh, I don't need to share that again. Stop sharing. Okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you everybody for sticking it out for the full hour and a half here. Um, I forgot to write thank you on this page, but you'll have to just hear it from me. Um, <laughs> feel free, of course, to get in touch uh, by email or follow us on social media. Um, we will be having our next week's um, webinar, I think is on owls, which should be really fun. Um, so come on out next week if you haven't already registered. And um, if folks had questions, you could stick around and ask. Otherwise, um, thanks so much for coming tonight and have a wonderful evening.